Well, hello and good afternoon, friends and members and uh, everyone, uh, anyone who joins us on these uh, Monday through Thursday, one o'clock uh, scripture study devotions. Um, and you, now you'll notice, I know you, you went to log on today expecting to see Mr. Bickle and then you see my face. I apologize for that. Uh, from this time forward, we, we have a, a new schedule, and that is I do, I'm do i doing Monday and Wednesday. Mr. Bickle's doing Tuesday, and Stephanie's doing Thursday. So when you tune in at 1 o'clock, I'll be hitting on Monday and Wednesday. This is just working out better for our schedules. And so, uh, uh, hello, hi, Rene. Good to see you, Natalie and Ray. Uh, good to see all of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a great uh, scripture for today. It is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. That is our epistle lesson for this week, uh, probably the text that I'll preach on, on on Wednesday and Sunday, although that sometimes changes uh, right up until the minute of. But um, I just want to thank you for joining us and, you know, had quite a week. We dropped off our, we dropped off our oldest daughter at college on Saturday, and that was a uh, you know, whenever parents do that, it's first time we've we've done it. So it was, um, you know, joy and sadness at the same time, uh, having to say goodbye, but uh, being so happy, uh, not only for our daughter, but for all the young people who are starting new careers or starting college. It, it's a big deal, and uh, and and we're we're happy for them that uh, they're they're moving on, uh, finding their own way in the world, and. You know, if we're going to give any advice to young people as they go out into new careers or new aspects in life, perhaps they're having children, perhaps they're getting ready to get married, uh, hopefully the latter before the, the, the primary, um, you know, how to prepare them for the spiritual battles that they will have. And I think this reading in the book of Ephesians, I think, can be helpful, not just for young people, but for, but for us old fogies, too as well. So we are reading from Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. And the title before verse 10 is the whole armor of God. You've heard this scripture before, uh, but as we know, uh, God's word is a, is a living word and continues to speak to us. You know, even if we think we have it all figured out, we can always learn more. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Paul uh, concludes uh, his, his letter to the church in Ephesus, and, and he begins with verse 10 with finally. And, and what does he mean by finally? Well, he's come to the end of his letter. You know, in the, in the previous five chapters, to kind of summarize Paul's message is, you know, he carefully established our place in Jesus Christ. He talked about some of the basics of the Christian walk, addressing certain things we struggle with. And in this last section, you know, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You know, in light of all the things that he had taught up until chapter 6, verse 10, um, that he had written about all that God has done for us, that how in Christ we have a standing as a child of God that we've been given a new name. 
He shared with us God's great plan for the ages that includes the church, that includes every individual Christian who has their own vocation, their own divine calling in Christ. And in, in light of the filling of the Holy Spirit as we walk in the Spirit, and he says, now that you have all those things set, there's a battle. There's a battle to fight in the Christian life. And he says, be strong in, in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, David said those exact same words in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, where it said, David strengthened himself in the Lord. And, and think about it this way, you know, you know, we're using this military image and the image of armor, and, and Paul does so for a reason. You know, he's writing Ephesians from prison. And, and I wonder if as he was writing this letter, he was noticing the armor that the Roman centurions were, were wearing and said, hmm, that's where he, maybe that's where he got his inspiration from. We don't know. But when, when Paul writes, first, you must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, then put on the whole armor of God. Think of it this way. Uh, a, a weak person, um, it doesn't matter how good their armor is. If, if they're not strong before putting on the armor, it's of no use. And it's not strong in and of ourself, but it's strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might and in the strength of his might. And, and interestingly, as I was, I was, you know, researching and doing some study on, on, on this text, I came upon a sermon where the pastor talked about some of the things that can waste our strength. You know, we stand in the strength, we stand firm and strong in the strength of the Lord. And, and, I, and I just thought it'd be helpful to share some of these things that, that can waste our strength. And these are the things he lists. Uh, committing to too many spiritual things. Uh, too much conversation, too many arguments, debates, and wrangling, and oh my goodness, is, if Facebook isn't, <laughs> you know, I, I've sort of, uh, my, at my own personal choice, and I, I'm not going to make that choice for you, that, that's your decision to make. I don't engage in, in internet debates or arguments any longer, you know, it, and even if someone addresses me personally, which happens from time to time, I'll, I'll talk to them individually. I, I, you know, all this posturing and argument and debate, um, um, it, it just gets tiresome, does it not? And it saps our strength. And he continues, uh, too much time spent in the wrong company, too much foolish talk, too much love of money, um, ungodly entertainment, a, a wrong attitude towards God or doubting his word. All of these things sap our strength. So no matter how good our armor is, if we're not strong in the Lord, it's not going to help. And then in verse 11, Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And he's going to explain fully more the specifics of the armor of God. Um, but God gives the believer a, a full set of equipment, a full set of equipment. Why? So we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, as some translations put it. You know, that Satan's schemes against us come to nothing if we stand in the power of God and with the armor that he's provided for us. And then he continues, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, now I, it's important to understand what Paul is saying here. He, he's not, he is not encouraging the believer to jump into spiritual warfare. This isn't a call to arms. This isn't get up and fight. This is a, a fact stated. Um, this isn't a call to battle, but a fact that stated that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers. And, 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 and he talks of it in, in many different ways, against powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness. So it's not a call to battle. It's a statement of fact that you are in this battle. It's there. And not only that, but we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're, we're not fighting against our, our fellow humans, our brothers and sisters. And, and in, in 2 Corinthians 10, he goes into a little more detail where he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So we're not fighting against people. This is a spiritual battle, 
right? This is a spiritual battle. And these variety of terms that Paul uses, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, all meant to knock Christians down from their place of standing. And again, that's the command is to stand firm, not to advance, <laughs> not to attack, but to stand firm. And, uh, it, and, and it's unfortunate, I think, when, when, when you study all of scripture in general, but, you know, in this specifically, you'll, you'll have theologians, uh, you know, we, we sometimes term them liberal theologians, and what they'll do is they'll take the, these words from Paul, and, and they'll say, well, when, when Paul talks about powers and principalities and, and, and the wickedness in the heavenly places, he's actually talking in naturalistic terms. So he's actually referring to um, politics and society and biology and history and culture. And, and, and I think that's unfortunate because I don't know that Paul could have been any clearer when he says we don't battle against flesh. We don't battle. It's not the earthly things we're battling against, but these spiritual forces. I think it's the exact opposite of what Paul is saying when we deny the fact that, that our primary battle, the, the purpose for the spiritual armor we wear, the purpose for us standing in the strength of the Lord is against these spiritual forces that, that work to, to knock us down so that we cannot stand. And then Paul gets a little more specific in verse 13. He says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. And, and I love that, because it begins with us understanding that our strength and our might comes from the Lord. We stand strong in the Lord. We put on the armor of God, and then having done all, we stand firm. So it's not just put on the armor of God and go about your business, right? Putting on the whole armor of God that you can stand. And, and this idea of standing, you know, we do, when we do the Lord's work um, and stand against sort of this spiritual opposition, you can't help but read throughout Scripture and, and these calls to stand are, are common. And you know, now I expect you to remember every single reference I'm going to very quickly spit out and there'll be a test afterwards. So Romans 5 verse 2, we stand in grace. 1 Corinthians 15, we stand in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 16, we stand in courage and in strength in the Lord. 2 Corinthians 1, we stand in faith. Galatians 5, we stand in Christian liberty. Philippians 1, we stand in Christian unity. Philippians 4, we stand in the Lord. Colossians 4, we stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Stand. In verse 14, stand therefore. Stand therefore. Now he gets specific about the, the particular pieces of armor. Having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And now some commentators have said the order in which Paul lists these armor is the order in which a soldier would have put them on. I can't confirm or deny that, but it makes sense. And so this, the first one, he says the belt of truth. And now, you know, the belt, of, the, the belt wasn't in a sense a piece of, it wasn't an armor, but it was meant to sort of keep all of the undergarments secure so that the rest of the armor could be put on. Um, now, I know this, when I sit down in my chair, first thing, what, first thing many people do, you take off that belt, right? And oh, and, and relax the stomach. You can't really relax when you got the belt on, but that's the point. You put the belt on, the belt of truth. It's not necessarily re relaxing, but it's getting you ready. And then the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate covers the vital organs. And uh, you know, we can't battle against spiritual enemies in our own righteousness. Um, any, any better, any, any more so than a soldier can battle without a breastplate. And, and of course, this righteousness, this breastplate of righteousness, it's not an earned righteousness. This isn't something you and I earn or work for. It's not a feeling of righteousness. It's the righteousness received by faith in Christ. And, you know, 
as one theologian wrote, thank God for experiences, but we do not rely on them. You don't put on the breastplate of experience. You put on the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness granted to us through Christ. And then the third is shodding your feet uh, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And, you know, shoes, readiness with the gospel of peace. And Josephus would talk about these shoes that the military, specifically the Greeks and the Roman armies, and they, it, it was shoes and they had studs or nails on the bottom. And it made the troops very mobile. And, and, and particularly Alexander the Great's armies, the reason for his worldwide success was written by many Greek historians was because of the, the mobility of his army. And not just the mobility from going from place to place, but mobility in battle. And part of that mobility was because they had the proper footwear. The red, and, and for the Christian, of course, it's the footwear, um, the army boots, if you will, with the gospel of peace, right? Not the gospel of morals, not the gospel of pointing our fingers at people, but with the gospel of peace. And, you know, of course, this is Isaiah 52, where it says, Blessed, how beautiful are the feet who bring good news in the name of the Lord. I imagine Paul had that in mind when he was talking about the shoes. And then in verse 16, so he's talked about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the army boots, if you will, of readiness for the gospel of peace. And then he says, in all circumstances. So it, kind of what he's saying is in addition to all of these things, these foundational pieces of armor that you should have on you at all times, there's a couple other ones that you're going to bring with you when you actually engage in battle. That seems to be not that the shield of faith and the helmet of, of salvation are more important than the other pieces, but that the other pieces are kind of foundational pieces that you carry with you always. And he says the shield of faith. Um, and, and when he had in mind, wasn't just a little round shield, but it was an oblong shield that would be able to protect the whole body. Why? Because in a battle, when armies would line up against each other, especially in the beginning of the battle, armies would shoot arrows. And, and it wasn't just meant to injure and kill, but it was meant to uh, confuse and separate. Now imagine you're standing in, 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 a, in a formation and, and you have an army shooting arrows at you. Even when you have your, your shield and an arrow hits through that shield, uh, that's going to be disturbing. disturbing. So, you know, we have the shield. Why? Because the enemy doesn't just want to shoot at us to injure us, but to cause confusion and panic. And so with that shield of faith, then we have the helmet of salvation. Um, in the ancient world, it would have been a leather cap with, with sort of metal studs on it. Now, it's interesting. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul also talks about this armor of God in, in a little different connection. And he speaks of the helmet of salvation in connection to the hope of salvation. That the helmet of salvation protects us against discourage discouragement because discouragement is the opposite of hope and you know as c.s lewis wrote in the screw tape letters one of the devil's most effective weapons is discouragement just simple <sighs> i'm not interested in this any longer or i can't bother anymore not massive attacks against the person but just discouragement and then the last piece is the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and, you know, when you think of the word of God as a sword, think about a soldier who, who never practices with his sword and then has to go into battle. He's really not going to be very effective, is he? And if he thinks that his sword is not inspired, right, that he doesn't have trust in his sword, he's not going to be effective either. And then in verse 18, Paul writes, praying at all times in the spirit. You know, kind of what he's saying here is, is using all kinds of prayer, group prayer, individual prayer, silent prayer, loud prayer, walking prayer, kneeling prayer, prayer before meals, prayer before bed, eloquently written prayers, groaning prayers, prayers that are just us speaking to God, praying at all times in the spirit. And why would he say that? Because this battle is fought in prayer. In prayer. It's a spiritual battle, remember. And if we're not praying, then we're not showing up for the fight. We're not showing up for the fight. But it's not just for us we're praying for, right? He writes, but for all the saints. That any good soldier is not 
only concerned for their safety, but the safety of the men and the women that they're fighting with. Uh, it's this instinct built into us to also protect others. And then Paul closes it off with this, um, and, and he says, I am an ambassador in chains. As we know, Paul was in prison when he was writing this. Now, many believe that the word chains he uses in the Greek has, has a couple of meanings. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. In one sense, of course, it means a prisoner's shackles. But it can also be used for sort of the gold adornment and sort of audacious gold necklaces worn around the necks of the wealthy. So what Paul, now listen carefully what he's saying here. He's considering his prisoner's chains to be actually glorious adornment as he represents, as he is an ambassador of Christ. That his chains, you know, the world may see them as prisoner shackles, but he considers them beautiful adornment that, an, that any ambassador uh, would wear, especially an ambassador of Christ. Yeah, good stuff, Ephesians 6. Um, my guess is, too, uh, tune in tomorrow at 1 because uh, Mr. Bickle will, uh, I believe he's going to be sharing his insights on Ephesians 6. And as always, you know, we're really encouraging people to uh, spend a little bit of time with us Monday through Thursdays as we look at the scriptures that we'll be covering in worship. And again, I just believe it, it gives us a fuller and, and a richer worship uh, experience when we've kind of uh, tackled and thought about uh, these scriptures before worship. In a sense, think about it, it's a soldier practicing with a sword, right? Uh, practicing with a sword. Well, the song that we're doing uh, for today is By Grace I'm Saved, written in uh, somewhere in 1682, somewhere around there. And, and the gentleman who wrote this, Christian Ludwig Scheidt, uh, born in, in Germany, became a lawyer, became a very prominent lawyer, but then had some pretty terrible things happen in his life. He was married, had eight children. All eight children died young. Not one survived. And then after the, the death of his final child, he found out that his wife had been unfaithful, and he divorced her and remarried and then died just a few years later. Um, but amidst all this time of being a lawyer and serving uh, as a, a Danish ambassador to, uh, in Germany, um, as a court advisor and librarian in Hanover, uh, he had this opportunity and he had the time to write hymns as well. And uh, it's an uh, inspiration to me when I think about how busy I am and I don't have time for uh, musical things. By grace I'm saved. By grace I'm saved. Grace free and boundless, my soul beneath and doubt it not. Why stagger at this word of promise? As scripture at the falsehood taught, know that this word must truly remain. By grace you too will life obtain. By grace none dare lay claim to merit Our works and conduct have no word God in his love sent our Redeemer Christ Jesus to this sinful earth His death did for our sins atone And we are saved by grace alone Grace, God's Son, our only Savior, came down to the earth to bear a sin. Was it because of your own merit that Jesus died your soul to win? No, oh, it was grace and grace alone that brought him from his hand. This ground of faith is certain As long as God is true it stands What saints have penned by inspiration What in his word our God commands Our faith in what our God has done Depend 
depend on grace, grace through His Son. Amen. Great song. A uh, couple other verses too, but I'm kind of starting to lose my voice. and Not that I had a voice to begin with, right? But hopefully my singing uh, doesn't inspire people with, with the melodious and perfect tonal towns, uh, sounds, because I know it isn't, but inspire other people to know, even though you can't sing, sing anyway, right? I, d I don't think God cares about how good, uh, how well we can sing, but that we sing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Receive the Lord's blessing. Be a blessing to others. Love you guys. I'll see you again on Wednesday, but please tune in tomorrow uh, with Mr. Bickle at 1 o'clock. Thank you much. Love you guys. I'll see you soon. <laughs>